Thank you. Uh, so my name is Jeppe, uh, and uh, I uh, made this article combining sequential and aggregated data for churn prediction in freemium games. And I did it uh, with uh, Paolo Burelli in uh, collaboration with the Tactile Games and the IT University of Copenhagen. So to begin with, I just want to mention what is churn. Uh, churn is when a user will stop using a service, and it's used in many uh, industries, for example, telecom industry or insurance, but also for subscription services like Netflix uh, and, of course, games. Um, and the reason for why this is interesting is because the cost of re-engaging players uh, is less than, the, than acquiring new users. So it's a pretty effective strategy for, um, for a business to focus on re-engaging their players. Uh, in mobile games in particular, uh, there, are some, uh, there are a few things that I want to mention first also. And uh, uh, in particular, this uh, mobile casual game, uh, Cookie Cat's Pop, it's this kind of bubble shooter. It's uh, characterized by, it's an unsubscription service. It's a freemium game. You just go and download it and then you can play it. There's no uh, time where you, we can see okay, this player stopped playing the game. It's a non-subscription service, unlike, for example, Netflix, when you cancel your subscription. Uh, and then what's also important is to think about how to re-engage them. So what is the motivation that they're using uh, or playing the service? Uh, if they stop playing because maybe the old players, they stop playing because there's no more content or they are frustrated with a level, um, we need to know that uh, to have a, an effective strategy. For new players, maybe they're just not interested in the game at all. Uh, so that is different strategies you need to re-engage them. Uh, in this paper, the churn definition we use, uh, we need to define that because it depends uh, on how our analysis is. Because we want to use it in a, diff, uh, in a business setting, we don't want to predict today which players are, uh, will stop playing today because then they will have already uninstall the game, and we can't really send any re-engagement uh, strategy, whether it's like boosters or whatever. So we want to have some kind of window where we do this prediction. So that is what I call this prediction offset. Um, then also one thing that we want to define is how long do we observe the uh, players for, uh, which is this observation period. Uh, and lastly, the time that they are inactive is what we uh, define as the uh, churn span period, which is this black line with a bar. So if they have been active, uh, inactive for more than uh, 30 days, in our case, uh, we will say that they have churned. Um, maybe they will return later, but we can't know. We have to put some kind of time limit. Uh, that's the way we do it in this uh, case, uh, which means that we treat this as a classification problem. Um, and just to uh, mention what kind of data types we want to use or uh, consider, we, uh, I have uh, what I call aggregated data. So for each user, we can have something that describes the age of the player, uh, how much time have they played in the last uh, 14 days, uh, and such. Uh, that's what I call aggregated data, and to just use this. Uh, you can use models for uh, random forest models, or linear models, or just some feed-forward neural network. And it's a simple data structure that's directly uh, easy to use directly. But what we want to do is leverage this dynamic leading up to the churn, this activity, uh, because we know that it's uh, it has an effect on. Uh, yeah, the churn, we can see the effect uh, because it's a very sequential, uh, yeah, this behavior uh, uh, leading up to the churn is very, uh, we want to leverage that data. So what I mean by sequential is, for example, for each user, you can have a sequence of how much time have you played, uh, the first day, the second, the third, and so on. So you get this sequence uh, of features. And 
examples that have been used in literature is uh, recurrent neural networks or LSTM structures, uh, convolutional neural networks, which can also uh, some 1D convolution, or something like hidden Markov models. Um, and that more that leverages this sequential nature of the problem, but it also adds more data and uh, training time. But it's um, what we want to test to see if this actually uh, uh, is improving our churn predictions. Uh, so as the title was, uh, we want to combine these two types of uh, data uh, and um, some examples of using this. This is for a classification problem described uh, in uh, yeah, this paper. Uh, so you can have like separate uh, ensemble classifiers where you have the stat static features and you have the dynamic features and you uh, get some uh, output from those models and you get like a combined ensemble prediction. You can also combine them in these dynamic models or hybrid models as they are described here where you have the dynamic features that you treat with that dynamic model and you combine that somehow. Uh, here you can just take the, for example, LSTM activations and combine with the static features. So we want to take this idea of combining the uh, aggregated data and the sequential data uh, and see which ones actually perform well for games, premium games in particular. So yeah, that is what should our combination model be when we treat churn like this. So the experiment uh, we did was that we had 10 days from in this period and uh, we had 2 million uh, records and that correspond to 800 uh, thousand yeah, uh, unique players. Uh, and then we used 10 uh, for cross-validation to check the uh, yeah, yeah, to check the results. And the type of data that we used, uh, the sequential data mostly were some features that related to player activity uh, and completion rates. So for example, how many uh, tries did they have to uh, do before completing a level and the skill level. Uh, so that's kind of the way of thinking of, you know, the activity and the frustration level and you know how well is the player playing the game. And it's mostly game agnostic. It is a bit game specific, but uh, we want to use it as agnostically as possible because then we can maybe also apply to other games. The aggregated data, um, I, uh, we chose some features that we have uh, heuristically seen describe player personas pretty well. So what I mean by player personas is that some players are uh, they play once in a while. Uh, they are not really so engaged in the game, uh, but they play it on the train or they play it, uh, you know, every Friday or whatever. Um, and then you have some that use all the features of the game and they are very engaged. Um, and maybe also, uh, yeah, uh, also how much they have progressed in the game and where did we acquire them from. And the reason why uh, we also want to use this is that uh, when we think about sequential data, it's not maybe enough that we just have this kind of uh, activity leading up to the churn because the very active player, it's a much stronger signal if they stop playing uh, rather than this absent player is uh, the fact that he hasn't played for seven days doesn't matter so much. So that's why we want to supplement this uh, data with the aggregated data. But it's a bit more specialized features, which, uh, yeah. So the combined approach that we want to do is that we have these two data types, and for this experiment, we tried some different setups. One way to include the data could, of course, just be to put all this static data into the sequential data, and you get some uh, uh, huge LSTM network input size, and it's uh, not very computationally effective, but uh, it's worthwhile to try. You could also just take the features and just all this sequential data, you could just flatten it into one. That is also what is being done in some literature. So we want to try that and see how 
flattening the input works. Uh, we can also treat it as some kind of auxiliary data. So we can take the LSTM activations like the previous paper and uh, this aggregated data and combine it into some concatenation there. Uh, we can also make it deeper, see if it uh, helps. Um, we can also get the, to have this ensemble method where we get the predictions and then we uh, concatenate it and then we uh, yeah, use this concatenation again as a um, as our model. Uh, and then one thing we also wanted to try was to use this uh, player persona, or now I wrote player persona data, but the aggregated data, we use that to prime the LSTM to uh, maybe set the initial state so it would, um, so we could leverage it that way. So you set the initial hidden states of the LSTM with this player data. Uh, <clears throat> so when we do the flat uh, feature importance, uh, when we do, when we flatten the data and try to use a random forest classifier, uh, we can also get some feature importance out just to maybe uh, uh, have some sanity check. And we can see that according to uh, this is that the activity in the last part of the observation period is also what matters the most. And that's in line with what we see in literature, that it's this behavior leading up to the churn that actually has an impact on whether they churn or not. Uh, least important is whether they convert it or not. Uh, so it's, and in the middle you have these days that are in the middle or la uh, first part of the observation period. So it's not so important, uh, the early part. So what we see from this experiment is that um, Generally, the LSTM, if we just look at the, not including any of the aggregated data, the LSTM actually, liber, uh, actually uh, works pretty well. It works better than the artificial neural network uh, and the random forest method, at least in terms of area under curve when we have this uh, rock curve. Um, and then uh, lastly, or even better, is when we include the static data uh, or the aggregated data also. Uh, but uh, the differences between them are not really that significant. Um, it's kind of, they are overlapping. Uh, so the performance is more a matter of maybe including more game-specific data. Um, yeah. And also one thing that I think would be worthwhile to, uh, before using this in a production setting, uh, there are some things that I uh, think should be looked into more. Uh, one is that um, the churners, there are a lot more of the newer players that churn. So just because we have something that says that they churn, it doesn't really tell us what strategy we should use. That was what I was talking about in the beginning, that new players are maybe just bored uh, of the game, or they, are, they don't find it interesting. So it doesn't help to give them more boosters to play through the game. They, they want to be challenged. So this, uh, this impact of having a lot of new players that churn, uh, it seems like it would be, uh, it would need some reasoning for why they're churning. So uh, new, how old the player is, is one aspect, but of course the motivation that will uh, re-engage them should maybe be thought into this model also because it's, um, uh, it has an impact how you re-engage them. Uh, also, like, like I mentioned, it is small differences, so it seems more like it's just because we add more data. It's not so much the architecture that um, uh, really improves the predictions. And also thinking about what features we used. Uh, we, if we want to have it as game agnostic as possible, we don't want to, uh, so we can use it in other games. We don't want to maybe use these very specific game features. Um, so that is uh, one thing that we also want to do, is to check um, how does it actually perform in other settings, uh, not necessarily mobile casual games. 
Uh, so, yeah, to conclude, uh, using an LSTM architecture is actually pretty efficient at leveraging this dynamic data uh, leading up to the churn, and uh, at least for casual mobile games. And uh, it works better than just having this flat model or flattening the data and, and uh, doing the prediction that way. Player personas, I mean, maybe it's more, uh, you know, player uh, heuristics that we know define the player types, they help them, they improve the predictions. So uh, maybe uh, that is also worthwhile to uh, keep uh, or to use in, a, if you want to use it in a production setting. And lastly, all things considered, using the player data to initialize the hidden state, it seems to be the most efficient, computationally efficient way of doing it. And I mean, it's, uh, it, it improved the uh, predictions, but sometimes it's just more a matter of using more data that uh, helps. And yeah, with that, thank you. So you're thinking that they play the game and then they abandon it for some time. Maybe they reached end of game content and uh, you know, then you send out a push notification later to see if they are engaged. Uh, I, I think one thing that would be good is to do some kind of uh, push notification, some A-B test, see if uh, that helps. And also, if they abandon the game, it's because it's more long-term players. Uh, and what typically uh, we have seen also is that it's, it's because they reach end of content. There's no more content, so you can only play through these levels uh, so much time before you get bored. Uh, we didn't do any A-B testing like that, but I think that would be the way forward to at least test the uh, long-term players. Uh, some players did appear again, um, but um, yeah, specific testing to, to reach them, uh, yeah, I think that they would probably also be the most interesting target uh, for, uh, for this. It, it, uh, I, I think it has some bi-weekly updates, maybe. Uh, I can't remember the exact schedule, but the new content is coming every time, and maybe that's also why I chose, uh, I didn't mention it, but the 30-day period for churn uh, was chosen because it needs to be longer than a week because there's weekly variations, but it also needs to include update schedules, so... Um, uh, yeah, uh, they would be a good target to try some push notif notification A-B test with. Um, so when I have, uh, I mentioned that I have 10 days that I take data from, and I make sure that there's no overlap between the observation dates. Uh, so the cross-validation is basically training on the nine days and then using the remaining date of data. So it's like a, in a, in a, in a 
uh, yeah, I mean, uh, each of these days, prediction dates, has 14 days preceding observation window, but these never overlap. Um, and uh, yeah, they are split over uh, this period that I wrote. So there's some days in between each observation period. And then I train the model on each. The, so for each date, I have 10 dates that I sample uh, data the last 14 days uh, of observations from, uh, because that's the observation window. That's 14 days long. So I have 10 specific dates with 14 days of sequence, 14 days sequences, and use that for the cross validation. Okay, so um, I don't know about you, but I'm really hungry, so I'm going to try and whip through this um, so that we can all get to lunch. So um, I'm Oliver Cholton. I'm a PhD student at the University of York, and so this is a project um, supervised by Peter Cowling, uh, Ken Horwick, who's not here, and Jane Borker. And so I'll be looking at um, methods for the statistical analysis of virtual goods. So this, the, the, the use case here is video games, so for this particular presentation, but the types of methods can be applied to all virtual goods. So a good place to start is probably what are virtual goods. So in very general terms, they're rivalrous digital tokens in virtual worlds. So Richard Bartle's quite a tough one to follow, so I won't get into the kind of realities of virtual worlds here, but in general terms, that, that's kind of the definition we're using. Um, so they're artificially scarce, which means that um, they're restricted, that the, their access to them is restricted only by virtue of their design. So this is like uh, an apple in the real world is actually scarce because there's a finite number of apple trees and so on and, and, and that type of thing. So um, in virtual worlds, they're artificially scarce. So the designer might say, we're only going to let's set this to the rate of Apple production, as, as a fictitious example. And finally, they're developer-governed, um, brackets unregulated. So this has kind of some interesting um, analytical side effects and things that we need to consider, um, which I'll get to. So why are virtual goods important? So they're central to the gameplay experience. So I'm not, I'm not a, a game experience researcher, so this is in a very naive sense of the word. Um, but you can imagine when you're playing things like MMOs um, and mobile games, the tokens that you use are kind of, that, that's, that's why you're playing the game, that's, that's what you're collecting. Um, so they're important for that reason. Also, um, and this is probably most applicable to MMOs, which will kind of become relevant, um, is that their availability dictates the rate of content consumption. So if you have, uh, like a, in an MMO, a super late game item that is all of a sudden absolutely abundant, then all of your players will be consuming all of the content that you've created very quickly, which is a problem if you're a developer, <coughs> publisher, because you have to keep up with this rate of content consumption. And finally, monetization. So off the back of the last presentation, um, selling virtual goods is a great uh, source of revenue for developers and publishers. So, <coughs> so which problems need solving? So, so this is a methods paper. So it's kind of which methods work gen for generally analyzing virtual goods um, as opposed to solving a specific problem, although the problem, problem posed in this paper is hyperinflation. Um, but I won't get into that. So hyperinflation is a big problem. So this is usually down to bugs. So if anyone's familiar with the story of Diablo 3, there was a duplication bug, and basically, yeah, so the, the, their economy was just absolutely destroyed. Um, that, in combination, they had a real money auction house, which it, it was an absolute mess. So that's a real problem. Um, second, real money trading. So this is also a problem, unless you're Diablo 3. But anyway, um, so people trading real, uh, virtual goods for real money um, kind of behind the back of a developer can be a problem because that means that the developer is no longer getting revenue. And we can detect traces of real money trading in the economic, economic activity of players, um, things like big donations, donations to, between players and that type of thing. Um, there's a bunch of methods on that, but this, this is just kind of one area of the problem. And item balancing. So when you release an update, how do you know that the items that you've released are kind of appropriate power-wise, where you can kind of see how much they're trading for on, on a marketplace? That type of thing. So, so this is not an exhaustive list. This is just kind of a few, um, I think, interesting ones. So there's three main methods that this paper focuses on. Um, so 
typically statistical methods are a bit dry, so I'll try and spice it up a bit before lunch. Um, so there's bivariate plots. This is simple x, y. That makes sense. Um, there's price indexes, so this is kind of where it specializes into uh, the kind of financial analytics and market analytics side, and statistical tests, so I think hopefully everyone knows what statistical tests are. Um, so bivariate plots, uh, super simple method, you've got an XY, how you plot it can, can kind of dictate which, uh, dictate the strength of the answer to the question that you're posing by plotting that data, if that makes sense. Um, easy to interpret, depends what you plot, it, you know. Um, and high-level overview. So, so the bivariate plots here are useful um, if, say, you're an indie dev and you can't afford player-by-player uh, -player analytics or you don't have the computational power to do it, um, then you can use techniques like this. It's kind of a high-level snapshot. Or if you want to show your investors that your economy is, is doing well, your virtual economy is doing well, and um, things like that. So price indexes, so they offer a kind of quantile overview. So a price index, I'll, I'll elaborate further, but um, it's a way of plotting the cost of living for a subpopulation, uh, a, a, sub, a subset of items in a market. So the cost of living uh, generally, so you think things like the uh, consumer price index, so this is how much uh, the cost of like, you know, bread, milk, that, that type of thing changes over time. So it's kind of that, that kind of flavor. And going back to the first slide, this is kind of in a very hand wavy way, a proxy for the rate of content consumption. So if we can plot the index for say the top quartile of items, and we can see that the prices of the items are increasing, then perhaps the late game content is too difficult because maybe players are dropping out, the items become less available, so they become more expensive, going back to the uh, rarity. Um, and the statistical methods. So these are classical, um, they, they're good uh, to kind of quantify any conceptions that you've developed while you're analyzing the virtual economy. Um, and they're my sanity check. So I'll kind of work through an example um, now. But before we continue, so I do actually need some data. So in order to apply these methods, I'm using the old school RuneScape economy. So this is a very well established economy. Um, I'll just whip through these. So it's all of the items go through a central exchange, which is good. Uh, players can trade between each other, but the assumption here is that you know, the majority of, of trade happens through the, the market and the exchange, sorry. The data is available through an API, which is a huge bonus. Um, I don't, I'm not affiliated with Jagex at all, uh, the developer, so I can access their data remotely, it's perfect. Um, huge player base, so this is kind of hopefully generalizable, um, and it's well established. So a study like this hopefully will act as a good benchmark for kind of making, doing more studies. So let's start with the bivariate plots. So I'm gonna fly through these quite quickly. Um, so if we start, that one's cut off, if we start with plotting the mean percent change against the price for every item in the exchange. So uh, for this data, we have about 3,400 items going back 180 days. So that includes weekends because it's an online game. So that's about six months of real world data. So we end up, this would actually, in its raw form, is a scatter plot. Um, but obviously, you can't tell density on a scatter plot. So make a, essentially a, a 2D histogram and then apply a blur to that histogram. So this is a kind of very bootleg way of doing clustering, um, but it lets you kind of intuitively interpret these kind of axes. So the little orange uh, dash on the axes is uh, zero, so it's between minus one and plus 1.5, and so we see we've got a cluster kind of around zero. That's what you'd expect with kind of inflation. You'd, if, it, if, if it was horrifically inflating, for example, you'd see this kind of, the, the cluster itself be much higher on the, on the y-axis. Um, so it, it, I, I kind of won't explore this graph much further, other than, um, we're looking for clusters. We're, we're not looking for any weirdness, basically. Um, and this, this is kind of, because the benchmark nature of this data set, um, we, we're not expecting weirdness here. So another one you can do, so coefficient of variation. So I'm not going to get into that. So it's a very naive estimate of volatility. So we look at volatility versus price change. And again, we're expecting uh, a, a reasonably small cluster. Um, you can see, I'm not sure how well it shows up at the back, but there's kind of items, shades of items kind of spreading out. I won't, I won't go too far into that. The main takeaway is that it doesn't look too weird, which is good. So, uh, so on to price indexes. So there's two main types of price indexes you can use when you're analyzing a market. So that's a naive index and a weighted index. So a naive index, um, super simple to make. You take for every item in whatever category you're looking at it, 
looking at. So if it's uh, in the real world, if you're looking at, the, say, the UK economy, which is probably going to be interesting over the next few months, uh, you might look at the companies, you might pick the top 100 most valuable companies. So that's the FTSE 100, uh, top 250, um, and whatever. So that's an naive index. Um, and the, the different indexes are used for answering different questions. So a weighted index um, is kind of the, the cost of living for a bracket. So hopefully this will make more sense with a plot. So an index is obviously a time series, so you have value over time. Um, if we split the items in the RuneScape market into quartiles, then we can plot the value of these items in these different brackets. So if we start with the lowest bracket, I deliberately strip the uh, axes labels off because it's it's not important, but the lowest, so this is the lowest 25% of items and the total sum of the cost of these items. So we can do this for each quartile and we can see um, following bivariate plots that they're kind of nothing too weird is happening. Um, on the indexes, they, they look like there might be this kind of growth in, the, in the, maybe the middle two, a bit of weird behavior in the extremes. But the important reason for plotting these ones is that from this we can tell, well, for the lowest bracket, so the, the blue line at the bottom, we can see that the price of the items that the new players are most likely to encounter, the, the cheapest items, um, it seems fairly stable. Um, the the X is unable, but it, it seems fairly stable. And then the most expensive items, um, it, it's much more jagged generally so this is kind of starting to build an intuition about what's actually happening in in this virtual economy without looking at the individual player behavior so a, a more powerful thing that you can do using an index is to plot the returns so this is a first differencing operation so you essentially instead of looking at the raw value you look at the difference between the values so this this kind of is useful for a number of reasons so if if you're looking at a raw series you can't necessarily tell any interesting time dependence between the changes, but you can in the returns. So for example, it might, the, the series generally might go you know, up, up again, up again. Um, and then if you're looking at the raw index, then you know, cool. But if you look at the returns, then that might become much more obvious as kind of a, a maybe a curve, you know, whatever. But, but it, it definitely becomes a lot more obvious. Second point, scale and variant comparison. So when you're looking at returns, um, they're wiggly lines, but they kind of wiggle in the same way. So, they're kind of more like to like comparable. Going back to the normal indexes, um, we saw the, the large index looked a lot more spiky, and that's because it's using much larger values. But the smaller index looked smoother, but that's just because it's varying between, say, 30 to 40 as opposed to 1,000 to 2,000. So th there's less room for wiggling. And uh, so price return time series are the bedrock of analytical methods in all schools of finance. Um, so if you can get to this point, then this means that you can start to apply some much more advanced analytical methods um, and something a bit more spicy than normal statistics, so like neural network work stuff we saw, um, and some deep learning things. And, you know. So same with the normal index. This is a value over time plot. I'm just going to show them all. So this is more wiggly lines. Um, but importantly, they look like they wiggle randomly. So in the last plot, we saw there was kind of a, it, what looked like might be a growth in the middle two plots. But this one, it's kind of very difficult to tell. Maybe the green one looks maybe interesting. Um, but this kind of shakes the intuition that something interesting is happening in the middle um, because this, this new plot has kind of revealed that actually it, maybe nothing's interesting is happening, which we would expect given the age of the economy. So finally, statistical tests. I'm not going to go into the maths of this particular statistical, statistical test. Um, I'm just going to say that the test we used is the augmented Dickey-Fuller test, um, and that is its real name. Um, and this is essentially a test for um, strangeness in time series. That's kind of the, the, the takeaway here. Um, if you're really interested, it's, uh, it tests for unit root with the null hypothesis that the time series has a unit root, which is a property of kind of temporal dependence between observations. Um, I don't want to present the, the findings in a table here, so they, they all passed. But th this is absolutely expected given the age of the, age of the RuneScape economy and with the number of players, number of items, all that everything. So the question is, what next? So this has been kind of a, a benchmarking study, but it's also been a, a first dip. There's, there's been a lot of work on the theory behind virtual goods and virtual economies, um, but this is kind of a reach out into the financial literature to pull things like 
uh, make index creation and to pull things like statistical tests out and apply them. Um, so what next? More and better clustering. So you know the, the, the 2D histogram plot, that's a very, very sketchy way to do clustering. But a proper clustering might be more informative. Um, more advanced analytical tests. So the, there's a lot of books on the types of analytics you can do with time series. Uh, I've only read a few of them. And there's definitely, definitely scope to, to build on this and also to apply these methods to other titles, um, which is the next one. So, so we've applied it to RuneScape. Do these methods hold in, for example, World of Warcraft? Do they hold in other virtual economies that are not games? So if I applied this to, for example, a cryptocurrency exchange, would I see similar patterns in the variation between the, the goods or the, the, the coins um, and, and, and that type of thing? And better data. So this was 3, uh, roughly 3,500 um, items. It was 180-day daily observations. Uh, but I think we can do better than that if we put our minds to it. And if we get the developers on side so we can get more granular, granular observations, then we might be able to tell a little bit more of the kind of the, the more, uh, sorry, the, the, the shorter time period. So over six months, we can say, you know, that this seems to happen, but maybe there's some interesting weekly pattern that's happening that we've missed. I'm not sure. So, thank you for watching. Um, these slides are available uh, on my Twitter, and if you're interested in this type of thing, um, then tweet, email me. Uh, if you're interested in any of my other work, see my website or my Twitter. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, so, the, so I, I probably wouldn't apply an inequality index to the price series, uh, to a collection of prices. No, no, um, to the ownership. ownership. Oh, to the ownership. Yeah, um, yeah well, that, that's kind of, um, you could do that, but um, this, this is kind of focusing on what if we don't have access to the player's information. So what if this is a kind of economy like the RuneScape one, so I'm just kind of sat here. It, it's all happening on the Jagex servers. I'm just kind of looking in through the window. Um, so I can't necessarily access that type of data. Definitely, if you can access that, that type of data, then it kind of it adds to the story and it gives it much more, a much kind of richer meaning if, if you can calculate inequality type indexes. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, does something have to be tradable? So is something like Ooh, um, so in a sense, yes, but, but also no. And that, that sounds like a cop-out. Um, but so generally, uh, the focus on the rivalrous nature of the goods. So, so it depends on the nature of the score. So as an example, um, in the RuneScape economy, or in the real economy, one might be able to view something like money as the score, or one might be able to view something like achievements as the score. So money. Uh, is rivalrous because obviously if I have some, no one else can have some, uh, and vice versa. Um, but achievements say we, we can all achieve the same thing together and so then it becomes non-rivalrous. And so I think score is probably closer to the second one and then so it wouldn't be classed as a virtual good. Um, I'm not sure if the, the tradability um, affects it, but, but yeah. if you look at it from the Marxist point of view, right? <laughs> you know, the skills is added value. So, yep. so if you own your own added value to yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the, what the reply is. Uh, you, you, you can think of it that way. Um, whether or not you can apply these methods, I'm not sure. That's, yeah, a bit of a pop-up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. By the way, yeah, you can play the virtual personality. That's it. You can, um, you know, upgrade a player and then trade it. That's it. Yes, yeah. Um, another question, just in, uh, let's say, one of the differences between real economy and this game economy is that usually game economy is open in the sense that uh, you buy some minerals, you make weapons, you engage the battle, it's all gone, but the game is not over. These minerals could resurrect, otherwise it's just boring. Mm -hmm. And the real life is not like that. It's gone, it's gone. Yep. So what's the implication of that, the duration of the virtual economy, in terms of how it works in general? 
So, so virtual goods in general, you're right, so they're generated and they can be destroyed, and so you have this kind of concept, um, and this is, uh, comes from um, the book uh, Virtual Economics, um, Analysis and Design by Edward Castronova and Vili Ledenberger. So you have this idea of faucets and drains, this is not, it's not their idea, it's, you know, but it is, you know. So the idea is that you can, you can calibrate the rate at which you add new virtual goods into the economy and the rate at which you take them out. Um, taking them out is perhaps a little more tricky because you can't just take them from people. You have to kind of design encounters where goods are, are expended. Um, but yeah, that definitely has an impact and that's kind of one of the motivations for applying these methods to a virtual economy instead of um, a real economy. Um, yeah, because we, we kind of need to understand how the kind of design decisions affect the analytics that we do. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, benchmark, yeah. Uh, so what kind of effects, uh, except for example, hyperinflation, could we have found if there would have been a mistake? So I can kind of hypothesize that we might see, uh, if I take a game update as an example, so if, uh, following the RuneScape example, the developers were to add an update, add a bunch of new items that were ridiculously powerful, then we might see, say they added 100 new items, um, we'd see a cluster on the bivariate plot of those items increasing in value or something like that, um, or the indexes would be skewed um, away from the statistical test kind of measure, so we, they might fall out of confidence um, and that, that type of thing. But the only way to know is by kind of doing more, more studies and more tests to kind of compare. Yeah, yeah or future work, yeah. Thank you, and that closes this